All right. Somebody tell me something you learned from the Bible study today. Something that uh, illustration you used, or just something that said that uh, really spoke to your heart. Anything from any of the Bible study this morning? Anything that just stands out? As something that you got from the study? Get to know your Bible more. Get to know what's in the Bible more. Get to know what's in the Bible more. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay. We'll put those two things together. That's good. Yeah. No more when you do this part. It's like, why do you want to be like food? Do what? Scripture should be like food. Food. You know, I don't hear very well. I thought he said food. I was going, dang, I like it. I thought he said food as well. The food as well? Yeah. I said food for a second. All right. Any other things I want to tell you? We're all teachers. <laughs> yes, that's true. One way or the other. No, the one way or the other. We always think of teaching as being standing like up in front of somebody and talking, but when we walk out that door, we're teaching, aren't we? <laughs> People are learning from us one way or the other. Anybody else? I think what he said was, I think what he said was, It don't matter what you say if you don't walk it. <laughs> and we have to say that probably happens a lot in Christians. We say a lot, don't always walk it. Really. Talk it a lot. Sometimes. Some of us are constantly. Anybody else? I think there's times too, like, you know, if we, we listen to pastors on, on church or whatever, and they and that if something doesn't sound right or like, you know, we need to go to the Bible and, and double check. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. We need to. That kind of accountability right. goes all the way around. Because exactly. they're not all going to be dressed like Willy Wonka. But that is a very, well, very valid that point. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Part of that, you know, going back to the days of telemandy, we learned a lot, didn't we, that a lot were up saying a lot of things that uh, really were not the biblical truth. All right, anybody else from, we talked about, if you came in, we were just talking about something you got out of the study today. Anybody else got anything out of the study today or something from the study today you'd like to talk about or share that meant something to you? I, I think it really made me feel better in that when he said, you know, when he started out, he read the Bible because he knew it was the right thing to do. You know, and he doesn't regret forcing himself to do that, but then he would read where he was supposed to crave it like a baby craves milk. Right. You know, so it made me feel better to think that when I started out, I was that way too. <laughs> I, I think a lot of us, because as we become Christians, that's the wording we hear. You, you have to read the Bible. You, that's what you're supposed to do. And so that really is a very good segue into what we're going to do from here. And that is, I'm going to make this short because I know the study's gone for a good study today. Simply called, I crave it. And what do I crave? Biblical knowledge. Francis Chan, he mentioned the scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Very quickly, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at crave, and we're going to look at grow. Crave, what does it mean? If he says that in the Bible, like newborn babies, crave pure salvation, or pure spiritual milk. What is he talking about? Crave, the word, means to long for to want greatly, to desire eagerly, to crave sweets, mm. <laughs> to crave affection. Yep. It also means to require, to need, to ask earnestly for something, to beg for. That's what the word crave means. Now when it comes to sweets, I'm going to say, I do long for them, I do want them greatly, I do desire them eagerly, and I require them and I will beg for them. <laughs> I mean, if you feel the same way, I mean, and in my years, I have gone three periods of time where I've got off the sweets for sometimes as long as a year or two years, and, and you don't really totally get off sweets. I know about everything you eat has sugar in it, and, and all that. I just kind of went on with some of those binges because I am such 
make sure they're all, I love sweets. And I sit back there during the Bible study, I'm just, you know, holding on to the table and there's scratches back there. I, more <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I would beg for it. I, I mean, I love sweets. Do I have to have sweets to live? Wait, wait, these are the medical professional. Wait, sir. Do we have to have them? You have, have you have to have some, some okay. sugars, but not right. donuts. Uh, <laughs> you know, how about um, how about a baby? Does a baby have to have milk? Yes. yes. Does a baby want milk? I think yes. we all say yes. Because without it, would the baby die? Yeah, it yes. really would. See, from the milk, they get nutrition. The milk is the source of their growth. And without the milk, they will cease to exist. How about the desire to grow spiritually? Do you crave it? Yes. Do you long for spiritual growth? Do you want spiritual growth greatly? Do you eagerly desire spiritual growth? Do you require spiritual growth? Do you beg for spiritual growth? All those things basically I said I would do for, for sugar and for sweets. To crave, to long for is a strong expression that could paraphrase and we look at develop an appetite for. Crave. Develop an appetite for them. This is the only, you think about it, the only imperative in the passage in the Greek text that says basically you have to. So, what is an imperative? Absolutely necessary. It is absolutely necessary. Crave God's spiritual word. It is absolutely necessary that a baby receive milk. It is required. Without it, the baby will cease to exist. Think about this. God's Word is absolutely necessary. Required in a Christian's life. Without it, the Christian will revert back to the ways of the world. Is that true? Amen. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Pretty much a proven fact. That if you as a Christian are not craving God's Word, want it, have to have it, it's a desire, something that you just can't live without, and you're not in God's Word, then the tendency is going to be pulled to be pulled back into the ways of the world. God's Word is spiritual food that all believers should instinctively desire. But we must also cultivate a taste for it. What you said a few minutes ago. It, it happens so many times when people become Christians. you just got to read God's Word. You've got to get into God's Word. You have to get into God's Word. It's what you're supposed to do. A lot of people get into it and they go, don't understand it, don't know it, not sure what. And there is no craving for it. It's just, I, I have to do this. I have to stand up and I have to do it. So do you desire God's Word? Have you got a desire? Do you cultivate a taste for it? We were eating at Luby's uh, this past Sunday. And Diane, it was uh, Erskine, Linda, Wanda, and Mom, and Diane. Is that right? Not the Luby's. Y'all remember what uh, Diane had on her plate? It was just so scrumptious. Mm. Greens. How many of you yum. like greens? Yum. Uh. Now, <laughs> I was going to be real honest with you about something. It was spinach. It was spinach. Yum. Oh, yum. How many of you like spinach? Are you still there with me? Oh, oh, it was spinach. I was just going to tell you something. It looked like somebody had mowed my yard and picked up the grass and where is it was and stuck it in the plate. That's what it looked like. I'm just going to tell you that that was the deal. And so I should instinctively desire greens. They're good for you, but I can't even cultivate a taste for them. I asked if she even tried one time. Everything she could to get me to the salad. I, I could not get that. Okay, salad and greens are completely... Now, do you like greens? No. You like salad? Yes. I couldn't even go down that road either. <laughs> <laughs> she tried. I mean, she put croutons and ham and eggs and everything in the salad. And, and ranch. I mean, she, she said, you're going to be able to do this. And it just didn't work, did it, baby? I mean, she tried. She gave her best. Do you desire God's Word? Is your appetite for God's Word growing daily? It's sad when Christians have no appetite for God's Word. Ask God to give you a greater appetite for His Word. The point of the figurative language that we look at in this verse of Scripture is this. As a babe longs for nothing but his mother's milk and will take nothing else, so every Christian should take no spiritual nourishment save God's Word. Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's talk for a few minutes about growth. And we'll close out. As we grow, we discover that the Word is milk for babe, but also strong meat for the mature. You understand that? 
A brand new Christian can take God's Word and it's milk to them, correct? The problem is, people who've been Christian for years and years and years and years are still on milk, aren't they? <laughs> they haven't gone anywhere. But God's Word can also be meat for the mature, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. But so many people don't get to that stage. They, they don't, don't get, get to that part. part. But as, as you grow, you discover that the Word is milk and but it's also strong meat for the mature. It's, it's also bread, it's also, also honey. honey. And 1 Peter 3 18 it says, But grow in the grace and honor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now follow me here for just a second. We as Christians would all agree, I think we would, you tell me if you disagree, that we should want to grow spiritually. Am I okay with that? We should want to grow spiritually. We should have that We should pray. We would agree that the method by which we're going to grow spiritually is the Bible. If I be with you on that, that's where we're going to go. Would you agree that from, from the day maybe that you are a Christian, that there is some type of a preconceived concept about the Bible? Now maybe you knew about God Christianity before Christian and the Bible, and when you became a Christian, you had some preconceived ideas about the Bible, or you became a Christian, a brand new Christian, you didn't know really much about God and the Bible, but then all of a sudden a bunch of preconceived ideas, or conceived ideas, from your standpoint, comes in and begins to exist. Would you agree that that kind of happens? That there, there are some things that we look at, and these are some perceptions that we have about the Bible. Would we agree that a concept of opinions about the Bible that most likely skew our ability to really understand it? Come on, would you agree with me? Now think about this. How do you view the Bible? Think about these, maybe some of you may remember. The Bible is a big, thick book. Come on. Right? Yep. They got me out and of the, 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 the small line was the small print. Because it'd be honest, right? How many of you read that small print? Hey, you are. I heard how right now one of those more things back about that. I can't see it. I'd read that one. So, how do you view the Bible? A big, big book. But it should make it smaller. How about a book I'm encouraged to read, but I don't read enough sale? How many of you kind of read that one? You say, look, I know I'm supposed to read it. I'm not a reader. I don't read very much. That's it. I have to be honest at that point. I'm not a real big reader. How about a book with a lot of history? Would you read the Bible has a lot of history? And a lot of people say, oh, it's not a history about person. So I'm not being interested in all that history in the Old Testament. I'm just a history person. Chapters and verses. What's up with that? I mean, anything else that we read that's in really that kind of a form? You can't have to a new Christian that doesn't have a Bible that goes chapters and verses and verses and chapters and verses and chapters and verses 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 and Deep thinking. I'm not a deep thinker. Give me something shallow like the newspaper. <laughs> convicting? You mean the Bible's convicting? Shoot, I'm not going to change my ways. Why would I be something that's going to change my change ways? Names, words I can't even pronounce. I don't know. I don't even know my own name. Why would I want to get into the Bible and read something about names of people? I don't even know. I can't pronounce a name. I don't even know my name. How about places in the world that I don't know exist and some of them don't exist anymore? I mean, I'm really supposed to kind of get into some of that type of thing. How about, come on now, I will never understand all this. It's like trying to drink all the ocean at one time. It's just not going to happen, so why should I try? Now, that would probably get solved to a lot of this. Am I out here? Am I out here? I mean, do you, Do you not look and see this here, this big, big Bible and think, man, this is full of so much stuff? There's probably no way I'm going to get every bit of this done. And so why are you proud of it? Because it's fun. And that's right. Why you should. But when you look at it, you see a lot of people just say, there's no way I'm going to read all this. There's no way I'm going to understand it. So I'll do good. How about this last one? 
I really thought the Bible was just a nice decoration sitting on my grandmother's coffee table to be seen, not read, and followed. And not touched. And not touched. Don't you touch that Bible? That's right. <laughs> now, in my office, I have my grandmother's old Bible. Both my grandmother's old Bibles, I have them displayed. Because I do remember going to their homes and on those tables, and they're right, coffee tables, they would have those Bibles. But that's the way a lot of people view the Bible as that's that's not, well, that's sitting on grandma's table. We're not supposed to touch that. That's kind of decorative. Looks nice sitting there on that table. She's the only one that could open it and read out of it. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So for my Google search, let me give you one worldly person's view. This is a worldly person. It's a work of fiction. That's what he said. Oh, all right, all that stuff about the Garden of Eden, the magic tree, the talking snake, Balaam's talking donkey, the stuff about the Hebrews being slaves in Egypt without a scrap of evidence to back it up. A lot about this. And so he says this. So much of it is clearly allegorical that it to take it literally is to completely miss the point. That's the way a lot of people in the world see the Bible. So much of it is clearly allegorical that it that to take it literally is to completely miss the point. It's a work of fiction. You know what allegorical means? Symbolic. All that stuff that happened in there, that's just symbolism. It didn't really happen. It's some kind of trying to make a point by this symbolism. Not literal, exact, and accurate. That's the way a lot of people in the world look at the Bible. This is a world view of the Bible. I'm going to ask you this question. How do you and I really view the Bible? Do I, do you really consider it to be something to know better, to understand and portray the life of our Lord and not something that intimidates me to the point of shunning it? See, I view the Bible as a life-changing experience every time I read it. Should that be what it is? Every time we read the Bible, it should be a life-changing experience. Something that we've read speaks to us, it speaks to our heart and how Christ lives in our hearts and how we should be and how we should act and what we should do. And every time we read it, there should be something in there through the Holy Spirit speaking through us. Let me close with this illustration. When I started my master's degree program, I was given the option at the end. They said, now when you finish up the, the master's degree, you got you got options. Two things you can do. You can take an oral exam or you can take a written exam. Well, I'm not a very smart person in those type of things. I said, ah. Oh, I'd much rather take an oral exam instead of a written deal. So at the end of my master's degree, before you can get the degree, you have to take an oral exam. They bring you into a room, they sit you down, and there are these professors, doctorates in music, sitting there. The chairman, the head of the Department of Music, Dr. George Parks, back then, I don't know if anybody remembers Dr. Parks, but anyway, we're sitting in a room. I mean, you are a sitting duck. They can pop them out. Let's talk about Bob. Let's talk about Beethoven. Let's talk about German fifths and theory. Let's talk about this, this instrument, that. that Potluck, man. Just, they just start going. So, I mean, I'm sitting there going, oh, an hour and a half, two hours of this, Lord. You know, I don't know if we're going to make it. Well, fortunately for me, there were a couple of professors in that room that loved to argue with each other. Yes! <laughs> and sure enough, one of those topics came up that they loved to argue with each other on. And I just sat there and prayed, God, let them continue to argue. Oh, I need another three minutes, five minutes. Come on, God, let them argue. I mean, they just argued and argued. And then they have a couple quick. And I was through. Like, Thank you, Lord. That was not a very smart way to go. I'm just going to tell you, an oral examination on your master's degree, that's tough and it's hard. I would, I would not do it. Don't ever do it again unless you know they're going to argue. But one thing was certain. I was not going to get my degree without having an extensive musical well, knowledge. Right? Right? I mean, this wasn't going to happen. I want to ask this question. How did I get that, that knowledge? knowledge? I craved it. I wanted, I wanted it. it. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted degree, the degree. I wanted, I wanted to use the degree, degree for your degree. That's, that's what I wanted. That was, that that was, that was, that was my motivation. motivation. I spent, I spent many, many hours, hours in class and studied the material to be prepared for the test by the way. I took an oral exam. That's what had to happen for me to get my master's degree. So what if, let's close out. After, After four, four years, years of being a Christian, there was a test. How would you, how would you have done, done if you passed your four years? years? Or, how, or how, how would you do? Do you, do you want, want to know more about Christ? Do you, do you pray, pray for spiritual knowledge? Do you take the time to grow in the Lord? 
someone, someone would just, would just break, break it all down, down. I think that's what a lot of us do. I would love to know more about God. So I'm going to tell you something. Coming, Coming soon, soon to you my Bible study. The breaks are all. all. We're looking, We're looking at considering at this, this Bible, Bible study, study here. Uh, uh, a couple, couple more weeks in the summer. And, and looking, and looking at possibly doing, doing a Bible study call. Thursday, 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 Thursday. So you'll be hearing a little bit more about it. It's interesting to see, do we, do we really, really crave, crave enough, enough to make, to make the commitment? How, how many weeks that, that study will take? And it'll take, take you from the beginning, beginning to the, to the end, end of the Bible, Bible but breaks, breaks it down, down and helps, and helps you even to understand some of the, some of the history and the, and the geography, geography and, the and the people of the Bible that, 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 that really, really shape, shape who we are as Christians, right? Amen. And have you ever into genealogy? You know what my, my dad, dad told me? This is this pretty true. My mom, he, he said, boy, boy don't you ever, ever don't look at your family tree. tree. You don't, you don't want to see what's in there. Did you ever hear him say that? Oh, yeah. Boy, you look at your family tree. Yeah. You never know what you're going to say. Yeah. But. When you, when you think, think about Christianity, and you go, that's all, all these people that were involved, there's, there's a relationship there in a lot of ways, right? right? And you find out they were not perfect. Found out they were just like we were. They got up there, put their robes on every day, I mean, their pants on every day. That's like we do. That's right. So, so coming, coming close to you, or near to you, or soon to you, 30 days to understanding the Bible is what we're going to look at as possibly go into the fall. So I'm going to talk to you about that in a few moments. But the point today is great. Appetite going for God's word. Don't let it intimidate you. Be this big book about so many things you don't know and understand. Let the Holy Spirit work as you read it. And God will speak to you. And it will change your life. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this time and this day. And just ask God as we do come together, even in this time of invitation, that you work in our hearts and lives. And God, may we just as we sit here right now just begin to crave and desire and want to know more about you through your word. Help us, God, to, to get that appetite. Uh, if there's anyone that's here that's not saved today, and today would be the day of their salvation. They say, I want to start today with Jesus being my Savior, and I want to start that craving for His word. God, today is the day of salvation. They can come forward and accept you as their personal Savior. God, I pray for anyone that's here today as Christians as we evaluate this teaching and this idea of concept of knowledge and craving that God will search our hearts and lives and we'll leave here knowing that we, we want to go down the road craving and loving you and to love your word. Pray for anyone who's here that's hurting in any type of way that God, we can encourage them and love them and be there. I know you'll be there for them. God, I want to be there for them as a church and as a congregation. God, we love you so much. We thank you so much for who you are. This is your invitation time and we turn it over to you. For it's in your precious holy name I pray. Let's stand together. You allow God to work in your heart and life. Let Him speak to you through the Holy Spirit. And you uh, do as God would have you to do this morning during this time of day. I come to you for a